raise a glass to the past And the ladies cross the ages Fallen fathers from the motherland Whose lives are on the pages And the father said it best When he told us all the world's a stage So fellas, grab a glass And lift your spirits to the seventh age And um, I'm going to talk today about rock imagery or rock art in the southeast of the United States. But I'm going to focus on petroglyphs and specifically a certain group or style of petroglyphs that we know as the track rock style of petroglyphs. There are many other petroglyphs in the area, but this style is concentrated in the mountains of Western North Carolina, a bit in Tennessee, and then also the mountains and foothills of Georgia. But before I get there, I also want to give you a broader context, some of the other types of things that you do get in the area. Uh, for instance, uh, the drawings and paintings and um, well, rather just drawings and engravings from fine line incisions in the dark zone caves of Alabama and the northwestern part of Georgia. And then also the um, open air shelters, rock shelters that you get in that area where there are paintings. And uh, But my focus is going to be on the engravings, the pickings, or the petroglyphs, if you like, um, of the... Um, North, Western North Carolina and North Georgia area. This slide basically shows you the three physiographic areas uh, in Georgia, in the northern Georgia. In the west there, you'll find the region valley, and it's basically a limestone area with a lot of dark zone caves, capped by sandstone. And these caves, some of them really go deep. And uh, way, way back in these caves, Sometimes very difficult to get to. You've got to kind of go across little streams and crevices and so on. And uh, in the past, they had a river cane and also pine logs as torches. And uh, so they did these fine line incised and also things drawn with charcoal deep, deep inside these caves in that area. And then in contrast to that region valley where you get these broad valleys and plateau ridges, you get the Blue Ridge area where it's more metaphoric rock, rock that has been more demorphized through pressure and heat. And those are more rounded uh, hit mountains, sometimes with granite intrusions. Uh, you don't get as many caves. The valleys are narrower. And uh, because of the high elevation, you get more snow there. And um, but you also get these river valleys and big rivers running through it. And then finally, the Piedmont, the foothills, uh, which is a, a smaller version or mini version of the Blue Ridge, uh, where the summers are warmer uh, and uh, the winters are milder, but the valleys are much wider. And uh, as a result, um, agriculturalists uh, later on from about 2000 years ago, uh, had opportunity to develop quite big settlements there, whereas in the Blue Ridge settlements during that period was also a thousand years ago or so, it's known as the Mississippian, uh, tend to be smaller. Bridge and Valley has also got some broad valleys where you also get some bigger settlements. So I would argue that the uh, different areas provided different opportunities to people. And when it gets to imagery, the Blue Ridge and the Piedmont areas share a lot of the uh, kind of rock art that I'm be talking about, particularly the, the uh, petroglyphs. Now, sometimes when I use the word rock art, uh, it's kind of problematic because a lot of Native American groups do not like that term. Some don't care. Others say we don't have a word for it. Uh, we call it rock writing or rock markings. 
or just imagery. So archaeologists, I think, use a neutral term that a lot of Native Americans would agree with, is petroglyphs, which is the incisions or the pickings or the engravings uh, or the abrasions of when you apply a hard rock on the rock surface, so you take rock away. Pictographs is where you add pigment to the rock, be it through grinding up ochre or charcoal or whatever into a powder, mixing it with water or maybe a medium, and then adding that to the rock, or taking those things directly, an ochre, a red ochre pe pencil, or a chunk of charcoal, and uh, then just apply that to the rock. Even sometimes you can add, just take a stone, the powdery stone, and, and draw with that. So those will be drawings and paintings. Uh, and so often people don't make the distinction between the different techniques. But I think in this case, it is important because the Ridgeon Valley, although it's got some boulders that are petroglyphs and picked and engraved, it also has got incisions and uh, fine line stuff inside the dark zone caves in the limestone. Blue Ridge, mainly uh, petroglyphs, but also some paintings and some overhangs, but it's a far wetter and humid area, more exposed. Uh, and the caves there are on solution caves, and they're not conducive to preservation of the things that you get in the dark zone caves that tend to be drier, but they're still humid, but uh, the things get preserved far better there. And then the Piedmont, you get, might get the odd painting, but it's again, mainly uh, pecked, broadline pecked and engraved imagery like what you get in the mountains. Um, the, mo as I said, the most of the petrolers in northern Georgia and western Carolina are pecked and broadline in size, and they occur mainly in open boulders next to or near water. And I think that's important to note, this connection to water uh, in terms, just in terms of the observational level. And interestingly, with my conservation work, when I do remove deeply incised graffiti or engraved graffiti, I find that if you wet the rock, and especially if you wet the dust that's generated from grinding at the rock or picking at the rock, you create a abrasive emulsion, which add to the cutting power of the rock. Um, and uh, so you speed up the process and you can remove things far quicker, the rock. And uh, a lot of these engravings that you find on these uh, petroglyph boulders, well, most of them they survived because they were done so deeply. So it was a commitment, it was an effort, and it was because they added water that speeded up the process. If you have a piece of quartz in your hand, and uh, which is a very hard rock, and it either hit directly hit the rock or indirectly, what they call indirect percussion with a hammer, holding the, the, the rock as an anvil in your hand. Uh, indirect percussion, you've got bigger control and you can make things quite nicely. Uh, and often they had to stand in water. Sometimes they had to take a canoe or a log to go out to a place to make it because sometimes these things were literally in water, but if they were not, they were close to where there are springs or not far from water that people then could bring uh, to and create the process. The dark zone caves might have streams in, like I've mentioned, but uh, they tend to be moist, the, um, the surfaces. So that adds to um, the cutting power when you do it with uh, sharp lithics like a chert um, or, or rocks like that, quartz, uh, that you've chipped can create quite sharp edges. And sometimes the rock or the, the rock, the limestone inside these caves are muddy. They kind of weathered that way or the mud has just formed on top of the, the hard rock. And uh, you'll find that people just with their fingers could uh, engrave imagery in these caves. And then sometimes they'll add charcoal and the charcoal they'll get from the firewood there, from fires they made. and uh, they'll uh, add this charcoal, just the lumps of twigs or whatever, and they'll make these paintings. So, but usually it's kind of dampish surfaces or very porous surface surfaces, and that helps the imagery last longer than you would normally expect. And then uh, the 
um, paintings in the open air shelters, but not just sort of shallow caves, if you like, they were done by grinding up ochre, mixing it in the, the powder with water or maybe a binding medium, and uh, then apply it with a brush or a finger. And uh, when you do that, when you apply it in a liquid form, instead of a powder form or directly with a pencil, by applying it as a paint, that liquid penetrates the pore space between the rock, even if it's uh, uh, igneous, uh, there will be little interstices between the rock, little openings, and uh, the pigment will find kind of anchoring points within the rock. So it'll stay longer than normal, sometimes even uh, when things flow over it. But then what adds to the longevity of these things is you get silica sometimes forming on top of these images very often. Uh, in most cases, you'll find it, these things are covered by silica skins of various thickness. It's semi-transparent. Uh, sometimes it's less transparent than others. It's more translucent and sometimes opaque. But you'll find the images behind that. And uh, so those layers protect the pigment from weathering and erosion. So you get the anchored and they're protected by a skin. And again, it is... The process is quickened up by adding water, and it also the water adding it prolongs the life of these things. And then there's a third, a fourth category that I don't want to talk too much about, which is kind of something different. It's a petroform. It's like the Nazca lines or the the, the, the woodland thugs that are uh, from Ohio. Uh, these uh, things that you could see from the sky, uh, where they added rocks, in this case, fist-sized, milky, quartz-rich, uh, nice, onto these outcrops to create these bird shapes of various shapes and sizes. And uh, it, just out of interest, these things date to between 1540 when DeSoto and his Spanish conquistadors came through and desecrated everything and uh, decimated stuff. And uh, 1760 when the first Euro Americans settled in big numbers in that area, that part of Georgia, which is the headwaters of the uh, Bukmugi, or sorry, of the Coney River, and the upper drainages. And uh, this was an attempt by those Native Americans to resist this kind of a, a thing of resistance against Euro-American intrusion. And you'll find that these massive piled features would cover only a small concentration of um, people that's been uh, cremated and these people the bones that survive show signs of venereal disease that's not always sexually transmitted or cancer bone cancer so these were diseased individuals that communities will come together that lived in the uplands there small scale mississippi communities to uh, construct these so um, they don't necessarily have anything to do with water uh, they more in the uplands on rich crest and uh, they more linked to fire where uh, human beings were cremated or sick individuals and then disposed there with great labor and cooperation. But as I said, I'm, I'm focusing to this, this discussion on the track rock petroglyphs. And you can see in red there their distribution going from the Blue Ridge a bit in the uh, uh, region valley of Tennessee, then mainstay in the Blue Ridge of Western North Carolina, and then going cutting down into the mountains of Georgia and then the foothills of Georgia. And uh, the chronology of the age of these things, uh, they're difficult to date, it's very controversial, the dates that they've obtained from Petrolus. Um, guy called Ron Dawn has had some success taking uh, little traces of carbon from the pickings of, of, of some of these things and date them. But that's been controversial. So I've looked at other methods to do this. Uh, the dark zone caves, you can date some of the charcoal. There's problems associated with that. But if you get enough dates, you start to get a picture emerging. Yeah, I used overlaps as the main uh, way uh, to, to, to get a grasp on um, chronology. 
Uh, another way is old uh, post-contact accounts of early travelers. And a lot of them mentioned, well, not a lot, but some of them mentioned that places like Track Rock were there when the first Euro-Americans came in. Uh, Judicula Rock, too, when the first people, Euro-Americans, settled there. These things were still there. So you can argue, okay, these things were done by later Indians. But uh, if you start looking at it, uh, antiquity goes back in time and there's some systematic ways you can look at overlaps uh, one way is through the constructing high arrows diagrams and uh, you can see ways that things overlap uh, say if you get a concentric ring which is number one over uh, a deer track which is number two in one sense in one case and then in the next case you get a deer track on top of a concentric ring, uh, sorry, a deer track on top of a, uh, uh, say, a vulva shape, then you could say, even though the concentric ring is never uh, directly on top of the vulva shape, but because it's always, with no exception, on top of the track, then you could say, that with the transitive rule, that the concentric group is at top of the sequence. But then you can get a different scenario to where, say, uh, a figure, a human figure is on top of a, say, a vulva shape in one case. And then in another case, the vulva shape is on top of the, the, the human, uh, human shape. Then you could say that they're relatively uh, contemporary, and that's the anti-symmetric rule. So I use that recording at least 24 systematically different boulders, and with no exception, I got some sort of sequence out of that. And I was helped by identifying horizon markers as where you, in that sequence of overlap, you get things of known date. And one object of known date are soapstone bowls. And these bowls date to the late archaic. They date to between 3,000 years ago and 3,800 years ago. And the way we know that they're that old and that tight chronological span is because, because they put on directly on fire, direct cooking, cooking things within the bowls, and stood to cruise on the side. So you can get direct dating of uh, age estimate of when that bowl was moved. There's no problem with charcoal moving around like you get in the caves. You can get a tight date on when those things were uh, used. And uh, the chronology of a lot of dates now show Direct accelerator mass spectrometry data show that that is the date range 3,800 to about 3,000 years ago. And where these late archaic Indians who, who lived during that period, where they carved these bowls out, they sometimes left blanks, but you see these what I call quarry scars. Sometimes there's no preform in it, they knock the whole bowl out. Sometimes the bowl looks like a mushroom stem still there. Uh, Sometimes you just see sort of uh, tentative scars, but sometimes they will truncate markings that were there. And if they truncate that marking, it means that that marking must be older at least than 3,000 years ago, because that is the terminal date of when they did these things. So anything older than that or truncated by that must be predate 3,000. It might be younger than 3,800, but it's definitely younger than that and then any anything uh, older than that sorry then anything within it would be younger than that anything any petting or engraving petroglyph that goes within that scar will be uh post dating that date then as another horizon marker as a second horizon marker are these designs the concentric rings and then crossing rings that you get on the Sisyphean period pottery you get them in woodland period pottery too, but more in the Mississippian period. And uh, what we find on the rocks resemble the Mississippian period more. So that is another horizon marker, and it dates to around about 600 years to about 350 years ago when the first Europeans came in the area. So that is the second horizon market. And then everything sandwiched between the late archaic stuff and the Mississippian stuff, we then would assume they are woodland. So if you these concentric rings occur on top of, say, um, uh, tracks, 
and vulva forms and figures, then uh, those things will be most likely woodland. And then you get a few that were incised with metal tools. Metal tools came in about 1540 with the Spanish. And uh, you could see that some of the things were engraved with a sharp metal tool, but much fewer. So that is your final uh, horizon marker. And sometimes you get pickings even going across the metal tool. So um, if you'll see then that those then are later than uh, the contact period. And with all those superpositioning and also percentage frequencies that you find on the rocks, I was able to seriate and also see or sequence first and then seriate sequences from the from the bottom which is early to the top that's late and then the seriation is from left to right where the most popular things were so you get late archaic occurring almost every boulder and then you get the woodland in between uh, the late archaic are mainly um, uh, meandering lines and uh, in some cases very straightforward circles and um, little cup marks that you get cupules and i'll come back to those later and uh, then you'll get the woodland stuff on top of that will be vulva shapes figures and feet hands and tracks of human hands human feet but also animal tracks uh, bird tracks bear tracks things like that and they would be then covered by cross and circle motifs and also by nested circles cross and circles are last in the whole sequence in terms of uh, tra traditional sort of markings and then these cup shapes again on top of those and then also some metal marking thin in size but then some cup shapes on top of those that show that cup shapes go throughout the sequence which is kind of interesting and this is another way to show that with a horizon marker shown in gray and the long period that these things were made as that's why I call them enduring images. You also get a long chronology in uh, the dark zone caves where they dated with radiocarbon, things that go even further back to the terminal middle archaic around about 5,000 years before present, about 3,000 years uh, before the common era. And uh, so it's a long tradition. So you would think the meaning has changed, but I would argue that uh, with evidence late that I'll present later on that uh, even though the so-called symbols and the markings changed uh, the overall message was the same the people who live in these areas at least uh, post-contact times and we can trace back into pre-contact times are the Iroquoian speaking Cherokee and they mainly in the mountains but also in the foothills and then south of them and west of them, the Muscogee and Yechikti speaking Creek people. And they had a lot of similarities, um, apart now from the linguistic differences that were quite marked. Uh, they shared a matrilineal system of inheritance and also a matrilocal uh, system of where people will go and live once they marry. You'll become the father of your sister children and then your own biological children will become the children of your wife's brother and uh, and then also the the subsistence system was the same they um they cultivated maize they cultivated beans they uh various goods uh cucurbits and uh, they also um hunted a little bit um basically agriculture they practiced during summer and then hunting in the winter when all the leaves were off and there was greater visibility a more scarcity of food but they'll um they'll preserve some of the uh summer crops in grain bins and um their belief system was very similar too uh they uh, believed in a master of gang uh, the cherokees more so than the creeks uh, this master game was um, part of the Thunder of Family among the Cherokees. And uh, he ensured that there was always game available. Uh, they had the busk stemmer ceremony or the green corn ceremony at the towards the end of the year, just in front before fall. 
at the end of summer where they then gathered the crops and uh, they had a cleansing ceremony where entire towns will go to water and then uh, fast and aggregate or congregate in the townhouses and then go to the river after they fasted. Sometimes they scratch themselves, they let blood and uh, they'll have, they'll uh, purify themselves with water. And um, this was a, a shared ceremony and they had other things in common. Sometimes they live together often. Uh, there are accounts of uh, Euro-Americans visiting a village in, say, in northeastern Alabama, and it'll have a Cherokee name because simply because the majority of people will be uh, Iroquoian speaking Cherokee. And then a year later, he'll come and it'll change his name to a Creek name, a, a Muscogee name, because the dynamics have changed and the majority of people then would be Creek. But um, otherwise, uh, they were very similar, the ceramics uh, kind of shared. And an important thing is that instead of being sort of distinctive tribes or groups or nations, they lived in distinctive towns. Uh, the Cherokees towns were divided by valleys, and it seems that the Creek towns were also separated by um, different drainage areas. And so in this valley will be the mother town where you'll get a big townhouse, and uh, there'll be a plaza where people congregate, aggregate, and uh, there'll be a river nearby, usually facing towards the rising sun, where they could go and do going to water ceremonies. And um, a lot of the ceremonies will be done in the townhouse. And uh, then they'll have satellite settlements where a lot of other people will stay. And they'll extinguish the fire once a year during the green corn. And uh, then they'll all go to the main mother town and uh, reignite the fire from there. And uh, that fire has got sort of special access to the spirit world and the special rivers and so on. So the Native American belief system is um, they believe that the spirit beings, like a lot of other societies uh, and cultures and belief systems, that the spirit beings are always there. They uh, can see what the Cherokees are doing, what the Creeks are doing. but they're not always themselves available or you cannot always communi communicate or see them. Um, in fact, if you want to see them, you've got to be a very special person, a medicine person uh, with a lot of experience and a lot of training and a lot of knowledge of the traditional uh, beliefs. And among the Cherokee and I think some Creeks too, is if you want to see these uh, beings, you've got to fast for a while of varying periods. Uh, you've got to go to the townhouse or maybe to a little sweat lodge, which is a miniature version of the townhouse. They also had a winter house, uh, which was a closed structure as opposed to the open, more Ramada shaped summer house. And you'll go to this winter house uh, to fast, sometimes do, you know, sing, meditate, and uh, then go to the water or sometimes scrape, scrape yourself. And um, then you can access the spirit beings after you've been in the water. There are accounts of medicine people going in the water, transforming into snakes. Sometimes they're accompanied by dogs, like this picture I found on the internet, uh, where the dogs are helped to the spirit world. And when you visit the spirit world, it's as if you died, like dreams are a small scale death, um, altered state of visions, uh, epiphanies, uh, those are also considered to be small deaths. And in fact, they believe that you can actually die if you go too far in the spirit world. You can transform into something like a bear and never come back. And you can see this picture too is they go into sometimes behind waterfalls and uh, they transform sometimes in something else, usually a snake. And uh, then they can go up to the upper world. Uh, they've got this treaty at Cosmos, but it's not always uh, necessarily uh, arrange the same way as we do in the physical world. Uh, you can access uh, the sky dome if you go down into a cave. And in fact, a lot of cave drawings and incisions are of birds, of upper world beings or winged serpents. So you can go into dark zone caves down in the depths of the earth and then 
go into the sky or then compact sky beams because you'll kind of depict altered state kind of stuff. And uh, not while you're in an altered state, but, uh, you know, kind of commemorate that, sort of fix that onto a rock. And uh, then sometimes when you die, you have two dogs helping you, and then a medicine person will be in attendance to help you go to the spirit world, which is the land in the West. And um, that is a precarious journey because during that liminal phase, the other uh, medicine people want to uh, acquire your soul and get strengthened by that. So the medicine people have got all these uh, magical sacred formulas and medicines uh, that also they then ultimately throw into your grave covered up and that spirit world has got to be separate from this world and that's why native americans are very very concerned if you do open their graves if you cover it up that's fine but if you open it up you release a lot of stuff it's like pandora's box and uh, to leave it up is is not good and a lot of native americans now if the grave goods not should be not on display uh, skeletal stuff not on display and uh, if they ever get in touch with it, they have to go to water, do ceremonies, cleansing ceremonies, and do a lot of ritual to reverse that process. And uh, some of the rocks, rock markings and rock writings, some of the petrolists and petrographs are also like that. They are Native Americans that won't go to these places because they are uh, sort of surfaces or thin membranes, if you like that. Uh, divide the spirit world from the physical world. Then they also view certain things in sort of an animated way. Uh, they view river, for instance, as the long man, the giant with its head in the flood, in the, in the, in the foothills, and the, these broad valleys that I spoke about. The valleys aren't always that broad in the mountains, but they're still there, and people still have their townhouses there. And uh, that is where the feet will be in the townhouses. And then you can travel up these beings, uh, up the river, or trails that follow the, uh, the drainage or the river course, the river valley, up to the mountains, right to where the stream heads come out of the rock. And that's where you can enter the spirit world, they believe, where the... Um, the head is where of these spirit beings. And uh, medicine people or shamans can understand, and there's only a few of them, uh, men of high degree can understand what's going on in the river by listening to cascading mirrors. Uh, the, and sometimes they have onomatopoeia of the gurgling sounds like ukmulgi, the gurgling sound of the river that you know means certain things. Also, the substance of the river is like substances in, in human bodies that you can then take out and uh, use as medicine. And of course, you can purify these things. And uh, so the rivers that come down from the mountains are the trails, uh, or the footpaths that link you with the mountains. And to do this, to see the spirits, as I said in the previous quote, you must fast first and uh, then you can go to water and you can get then those spirit people as a guide. Uh, so as in the physical case where they use water to either cut into the rock or to have pigment go into the rock and become permanent part of the rock, so to speak, water also allowed for the transformation where there were experienced medicine people get stories among the creek too they they spend time together in a in a sweat lodge or they do dances in the townhouse or they come out of winter hibernation and they go into water and you find that they do hibern hibernate you get uh sorry they do change they do shape shift they do become sometimes uh these um horned serpents uh they can become other things too and um, the horned serpents are these uh, or tender, they, um, as the name says, they've got horns, but they've also got a crystal in the center of their foreheads. And um, it is said that um, once you have that crystal, you can read the minds of other people. So sometimes uh, medicine people strive to do that. And uh, as I said, the townhouses, 
you could still get them archaeologically. They very often on mounds. And if a town, townhouse falls in disuse, uh, they simply burn it down and they bring a layer of clay and they put it over that townhouse and they put the next townhouse over it. So you ultimately you get these mounds forming. And uh, the viewed from the top, the postal pattern would be concentric circles or concentric rings that you also get on ceramics and also in some of the later petroglyphs. Now, the, the central deity, which I've alluded to in the Cherokees, and especially with petroglyphs, there's a number of petroglyphs that they said was made by Judicula. And when they say that, they mean also by people who were accolades, who were family of Judicula, not literally him. And Judicula or Chunukulu or Chunkulu, uh, Tulikula, different names. The Western uh, pronunciation is Judicula. Different towns have got different dialects, so you'll hear Cherokees referring him in uh, different pronunciations. He was their master of the game. Master of the game you find throughout North America. We've got umpteen lang different languages, but a lot of groups have got the master of game. Even, you know, the agriculturalists like Cherokee, they do have him. And uh, among the Cherokee, the name refers that he's got them slanted. And if you talk to certain Cherokees, they'll say uh, that the slanting refers to this deep being's eyes, meaning that his eyes, his pupils are those of certain snakes, particularly vipers, and certain cats, particularly a mountain lion. And these animals or transform medicine people sometimes, they can see in the night. And that, if you have the slanted eyes, you can see into the dark. And it also means, as I said earlier, that you can see, you can read people's minds. So medicine people, very often the stories, they know what people are thinking and they can find lost objects. And sometimes a medicine person from a different linguistic group, like the Shawnee medicine person known as the groundhog's mother, he or they or she, I mean, the, the gender is sometimes a bit ambiguous, uh, they can come to a place and find hidden objects and very powerful medicine people. And they had this crystal that they got from the horned serpent's head. So that allows them to do very powerful things like reading your mind, but also influencing the weather, healing the sick, and uh, knowing various uh, formulas to do these things. Now, Judah Cooley is part of the extended family of thunderers uh, that live beyond the sky dome. He seems to be offspring of Kanati, who was a creator deity. And Kanati and his, his wife Selu, Kanati sometimes expressed as the moon. He's not literally the moon. And Selu is expressed as the sun. She had a lot of powers overwhelming so that the people she created and the medicine people could not see because the light was too bright. And then Judah Kula kind of interceded and uh, transformed into a snake. This also said that there was a rattlesnake that bit her and she diminished the light so that people could then properly see and practice medicines. It's sort of a constriction of a power. And uh, Judah Kula then was sent to Earth. He's sort of like an earthly manifestation of Kanati. And uh, Kanati was also the, the, the master of game, but Judah Kula on Earth is the master of game. And he was this tall red person with these uh, snake and cat-like eyes. And he found a medicine woman, a very powerful medicine woman, living in the mountains of Western North Carolina. It could be various places. I mean, place is, is, is kind of, I think, metaphorical. And uh, they had twins. And a lot of medicine people have twins as children. And a lot of twins are believed to become medicine people. And usually the one twin seems to be kind of antisocial. And the other one is pro-social. And then the antisocial one uh, influences the social one to do a lot of stuff. But um, Judicula eventually had to depart uh, because people just couldn't behave properly. And he kind of left them with instructions. And uh, so then the people that were left behind, they tried to appease him still uh, by going up to where he was supposed to live, which is with the mountaintops. 
uh, and that's where his townhouses were. He had various mountain tops. It depended on the town, and people will annually, or sometimes more than once a year, depending what they want. Especially if they wanted a game, they would go to the townhouse. They'll do the ceremonies. They'll fast, and uh, they'll dance, and uh, they might scratch themselves. They're going to the river, and then they prepare to go up to Judicula. And then on their way up, uh, I'm kind of giving it away, they will stop at one of these petroglyph boulders. And uh, then they'll go up up the river valley and uh, they will go up to his townhouse. Uh, if they're worthy, they can enter. Very often they fail to do so. Uh, but at least then they can ask Judicula to release the deer or the game that they needed when there was a scarcity of game. And there was a strict belief of the spirit world being the reverse of this world. Seasons will be reversed. Uh, the winter there would be summer year and vice versa. When it's dry year, there's a lot of rain in the spirit world. When there's few game year, there's a lot of game in the spirit world. So there's always kind of negotiation going on with the spirit people and uh, exchanges that you've got to make. Uh, for instance, it's considered that when you fast, you kind of contribute to the spirit beings and then they will release the game once you go up there. And it's not that the Indians did not believe in or they did not know about natural pro biological procreation, but it's some sort of a complicated belief in the spirits of these things would be uh, released and uh, it will help with the fecundity of the animals in the physical world. Now there's one, the oldest known mention of a petroglyph was done by Hicks and he was a Cherokee chief at the end of the 1700s. And he told an early senator in Tennessee, a Euro-American, uh, about Judicula and, uh, and how he's uh, linked to track rock that's the earliest mention, as I said, the late 1700s, where the people did not manage to go up to Judicuda. They didn't think correctly. They just couldn't go up to his townhouse. So he's, he came down and he created thunder. And it's kind of a metaphorical way of saying that he had them create a townhouse, which then eventually went into mounds. So with him coming down and reprimanding them, they then created a townhouse and a series of these townhouses. And one of these townhouses, mounds that eventually formed is Peachtree Creek Mound, which dates back maybe even to the late archaic, but certainly to the woodland, right up to the Mississippian. And the last occupants were during the contact period um, before their removal uh, by the Euro-Americans uh, during the Trail of Tears. They at least lived in the village next to Petri Ground Mound in 1838. So the story goes that Judicula, when he left, he went, when he left for the West, he went up this valley, which is the Brastown Creek Valley. And some of it, as part of the Choistori Trail, which was like a trading path of the Cherokee that you can, today it is the county road. I think it's also a state route that uh, follows that trail almost to the T, but that trail was marked quite accurately, I would say very accurately, by a land surveyor, Torrance, in 1832, prior to removal. And uh, that's pr before there was any European uh, coach trail properly in that area. There might have been a little bit there, but it, it followed this uh, uh, Cherokee Trail. And that that is basically the route that Judah Kula followed. And along that route, you find at least four or more uh, soapstone boulders. And at the head of this, on the way to Rastan Bald, where Judah Kula and his family went, he left his imprints. And 
some say it happened in North Carolina in the um, in a valley there, but uh, this account, this early account, refers to track rock in Georgia. There's another track rock that doesn't exist anymore. That's in Western North Carolina, where also they say he left his mark. And um, it's also said that his twins on the way up, they were born because his wife rested on the rock on the way up. And with her menstruation, with her menstrual blood falling on the rock, these twins were born. And they grew up really quickly and they ran around on this rock and they left footprints. And uh, this is, you find it repeatedly where um, women, Creek women or Cherokee women, they menstruate on a wet, a wet surface. And uh, then these will be medicine women, but the children will be born as a result of that. This wet surface being a transformative thing again, that idea. And sometimes the drop will fall into a river, sometimes on the wet rock. But anyway, so where they went to Braston Bald in this instance, and uh, they kind of disappeared. There's Braston Bald, the highest point in Georgia. The bald means that the top of these mountains don't have a lot of inf uh, vegetation. And um, the Cherokee today believe that although Chudukula doesn't live there, little people who's part of his extended family of the Thunderers, they live there. And uh, whenever you do stuff, even the Forest Service, when they want to do alterations up there, use pesticide, make alterations to the parking lot, whatever. Uh, they've got to consult with medicine people first, and they, in turn, have to go to water and consult with the little people and see if it is appropriate action. And then sometimes the elders will know, let the Forest Service know what appropriate action is. And if they say, don't use pesticide because the little people will get excited, they don't do that. And the little people like Judith Kula's family, they are believed to do a lot of these markings, like a track rock gap uh, that you can see two photographs here. Uh, it suffered a lot through the years from uh, vandalism. So in 67, the Forest Service decided to put these uh, grids over it, but they didn't work properly because they kind of rusted. People couldn't photograph through it. They reached through it and they did graffiti. And uh, then in 2010, the Forest Service came and they did these psychological barriers after I recorded the map the whole place proper, properly. And uh, now the psychological barriers with interpretation, uh, after consultation with both the Cherokees and the Creek delegation, the Tribal Historical Preservation Officer that you see here, and also representatives from the um, Georgia Department of Transport and some academics. Uh, they all came together and uh, did this uh, renovation at the place that then hopefully would um, help preserve it for future generations. Now, if you look at this rock, which is the biggest of eight rocks at, in the gap where Judicula left his tracks on the rock, uh, you'll find uh, the tracks of various sizes, sometimes also of bears and uh, of birds. But there's a jumble of other things. There are the um, bulbous shaped things, sometimes with the menstrual blood coming out of it. Uh, there are meandering things right at the bottom. There are a lot of cup hills that are at the bottom of the sequence and the top of the sequence. There are little so-called stick figures. So there's a lot of going on in this rock. And trying to disentangle it, I looked at it like an archaeologist would look at it, and I looked at the superpositioning sequence. First, I found that the oldest are these meanders and simple circles and um, also cup hills. And they were truncated, not on this rock, but at neighboring rocks by these soaps and extraction scars that I spoke about. So they are older. And you can see they're kind of just partial here because they are being truncated by later things. And they're also very faint, which is another indication of their antiquity. Then on top of some of them, you get these vulva shapes. And you get it at other sites too, with no exception. These things, when they occur, when they overlap, they're always on top of these um, older things. And then you get stick figures on top of those. Sometimes vulva figures on top of stick figures, but in this case, the stick figures on top of the vulva shapes. And then feet and tracks on top of those. Uh, the uh, sequence is a bit clearer at other sites. 
but it's never been contradicted in about, I think, about 26 cases now. And then you get these um, sometimes concentric circles, but then you get these cross in circles. And the cross in circles always occur on top where there's overlaps, and they occur on top of the concentric circles, and uh, they occur on the Mississippian parts, middle Mississippi to late Mississippi. So it's kind of um, interesting that. And then late Mississippi, sometimes you get fine line and size stuff, and then the cup fields. Uh, right at the end, and uh, then the sequence from the from I think seven of the rocks. The one doesn't have any overlaps. Just to recap, the soapstone extraction, and then the stuff sandwiched in between the woodland stuff, sandwiched between the early soapstone extraction that's archaic, and then the later Mississippian, and then the straight lines that come right at the end. Some of them done with metal tools. Uh, which is the post-contact period. So you get this long period of interaction with the rock. Now, at the beginning of the Brastan Creek, where Julukula started his journey, or close to Petrie Creek Mount, where you get a confluence with the Iwasi River, you get a place that what the Cherokees call the Aki, or the big place, the great place, the place where things are strong, where things are very powerful, and they're petroglyphs on all of those little rocks. And to get to those rocks, the Cherokees sometimes had to swim. They had to go either in a canoe or at least get very wet. And most importantly, stand in the water while they are applying these things. They also called it the Southern Gate towards Brastown Valley, towards um, Track Rock. Uh, that gets his, gets its name from the tracks that Judicula made and his family, but also animal tracks, um, and um, also uh, uh, the, the Bryston Ball. That's a special place. Now, this is considered even today to be very powerful. Um, some of these motifs, like the spiral that comes in later, uh, the two dogs there. As I said earlier, they kind of help. In the journey to the spirit world, uh, snakes sometimes are, uh, they play part in um, war ceremonies and, um, and various other ceremonies. This is the main island there. It's got, again, some spiral shapes, some snakes, and some motifs that you would find in caves, which is interesting. And close to here, uh, as I said, was uh, Peachtree Mount, Peachtree Village, Brastown Village. And in that, those villages, there were a lot of Creek speaking people and non Iroquois speaking people, like the, there was a Uchis, there were Natchez, and a lot of them were uh, ritual functionaries. And it's thought that maybe some of these people who did these pickings, which are very hard to see nowadays, they've been very much weathered because sometimes this is submerged under a river. Uh, but uh, it's thought that they did these things that fall a bit outside the style. But you can see the figure up there. It's got a, a multi-digit or a six-digit hand, which the Cherokee traditionalist would say that that's the maker's mark or the sign of Judicula. He was kind of like animal-like. He could sometimes transform into a um, animal, sometimes a snake, or uh, but often um, also a mountain lion. And uh, he had claw-like hands, and he had more than uh, the normal amount of digits. That sometimes you do get among medicine people, that uh, thing. And then you, you can see the one figure there. It's also got like a funny head, which is not entirely human. Now to go to Judicula Rock, which is associated with Judicula. It's not far from the present day uh, Kuala boundary, which is the reservation for the eastern band of the Cherokee Indians. Uh, the, the Cherokees basically during removal or just before removal, they split into three. Already in the late, late 1700s, uh, the Kadua band of the Indians, the Cherokee Indians, the Kadua is the mother town of the Indians. They were the hardcore traditionalists, some of their full bloods. Uh, they decided they don't want anything to do with Euro-Americans, so they went on their own steam west of the Mississippi, and they still a separate band, federally recognized today. 
And uh, then the, the second group that ran away and hid in the mountains, uh, and they became the current local group of uh, the, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And then there are those that uh, kind of adopted more Western ways. Uh, but some of them were still traditionalists. Um, others uh, at New Chode and places like that uh, became, um, they adopted the American parliamentary or the, the American system. Uh, they had a constitution. And uh, there was a guy called George Guest, Sequoia that um, designed a syllabary uh, where there's a syllables, these syllables in, in, in different, uh, some of them are numbers and some of them are letters uh, that he disseminated amongst the Cherokee and they became literate very quickly. It's a very eloquent system to, to learn. And so the Eastern Band and the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma uh, that was, was sent during the Trail of Tears, these East, the, the, the the Oklahoma people, the Cherokee Nation, uh, a lot of them died during the Trail of Tears. And uh, so they got the Ch Cherokee syllabary, which also you find the interpretation at this site uh, uh, that was done after around about 2008, around about there, that they installed this walkway after we recorded it properly. And uh, the boardwalk was designed by um, a proper landscape firm, and uh, you know it's a psychological barrier with interpretation both in English and Cherokee syllabary. This photograph shows some of the Cherokees during one of the open days, uh, looking at it, and uh, they're happy the way it's been managed because they were part in its uh, planning. And uh, you could see some of the river cane growing in the background, which was kind of sacred to them. They sometimes pick those or they'll go with a stick. And uh, when they go and discuss the rock, and there's also old uh, accounts dating back 100 years of Cherokees congregating. They're coming even from far and wide, from Oklahoma and so on, and pointing at the rock. They don't want to touch the rock because of the potency of it. And... Uh, they would um, explain certain things. Some of them view it as a map um, and uh, that combine both the things from the upper world, from the sky world, with things from ground level, this world, and also from the underworld. And um, so it's a sort of a, um, on its collapse, things from the different tiered cosmos. Um, the straight lines are thought to be rivers trails and uh, there's a story of uh, Cherokees that didn't do proper uh, rituals back in the settlement and uh, down in the river valley when they went up to the townhouse and Judah Kula came down and transformed into a snake or lightning and uh, as they were running down in the valley um, he jumped down and to stop his fall he made this imprint in the rock, and you can see seven, dig seven digits there, this big imprint of Judicula. Again, what they call his, uh, his, his maker's mark, and then with his sharp fingernail, he made these, he drew these boundaries, and he said, whenever you pass here, you've got to do the necessary rituals, otherwise you'll die. But then there are various other things on there that show uh, the depictions of Judicula and of various other things. And then you see the soapstone bowl extraction scars there too. Some of them that they never took out. So you see the blanks still left in the rock. Uh, this is the, one of the mounds, Kulawi. Sometimes it's, uh, you can translate it as place of Judukula. Judukula, we, we being the locative suffix of uh, Judukula. And uh, this is the mound after a lot of plowing of, of, of multiple townhouses that have been flattened by modern day plowing. Today, it's the campus of the University of Western North Carolina. And that's where a lot of the people who belong to his sodality or cult, if you like, it's not a good word, cult, but they then use that as the staging area to then do rituals, to go up this Caney Creek Valley, past Judicula Rock, uh, up to Tennessee Bald, to, um, to appropriate things from him. And uh, you can see it's a cardinal direction thing. And another thing was from Canuga Town via the other track rock 
which is in North Carolina that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was destroyed or taken when they built a railway bridge there and people will go up that creek and go to Tennessee Bowl and also to the coolest courthouse, which is the equivalent of Braston Bowl, but this is just in North Carolina. And this is what Judah Kula's townhouse looked today, or the so-called, uh, some people call it the Devil's Courthouse, but it's the missionaries who called it that because they considered uh, Judah Kula to be the devil. Uh, they're going to change that name, the Judah Kula's townhouse, or, uh, you know, it's got about going by other names too. It's got small little caves in it, uh, very difficult to reach. It says that uh, uh, accomplished medicine people can go up there like Judicula's wife and Judicula, but others can't walk vertically up cliffs. And sometimes you get also footprints up vertical surfaces. This is the secret of Judicula, Judicula rock. What you see today is an accumulation of thousands of years of adding uh, imagery to it. And uh, then it started off with the basins, cup hills, and meanders, uh, not only at Judicula Rock, but at various um, sites with superpositioning that are part of the track rock style. I called it that style because track rock is where it was first recognized, and it's also got most of the sequence intact. It's not always that apparent at other sites, but other sites fill in that gap in the sequence. And we know that basins where they ground stuff, maybe medicines, which they also did some of the bigger cup hills and so on, um, they ground medicines. And the meanders, uh, we're not sure what those are. Later on, it's been interpreted as, as I said, rivers and pathways, trails that connect places on the landscape. And those date back to the late archaic early woodland. Um, cup hills is little cup shaped marks. Uh, that you can form in a fairly short time, especially when you add water and you've got this dry powder that you then change into an abrasive slurry. And then if you knock it, uh, you kind of create a three-dimensional bell-shaped curve or Gaussian curve where the probability of knob knocking the center is higher than knocking the side. So before you know, you, you, you create this basin shape. And the Indians sometimes, according to ethnography, uh, would take the substances and they'll imbibe the the powder. And the powder is said or is known to have trace elements in it like uh, copper, zinc, uh, calcium, things like that, that can help pregnant women during when they depleted uh, during pregnancy. Um, also, it helps with heartburn, uh, the magnesium and stuff in it, uh, you know, with, before people go hunting. So, we think that's a mineral supplement, but it's also kind of contact with the spirit world where you broach this uh, uh, barrier between the worlds. And uh, it's also, we know that they sometimes uh, pounded tobacco, lead native tobacco, which is kind of like an altered state substance if you smoke it straight. And um, also various medicines they'll mix, mix in there. Um, uh, it's known that they would also pound uh, ochre grind powder in there for, for, for to put it on their bodies. And uh, there are accounts of them taking a, a ceramic pot filled with water from the creek, run it at the top from the top of the rock over the rock and have other containers at the bottom and they'll catch the water. And the process of running across the rock apparently they believe would attract medicine. So whoever got that pot from the bottom, that water, imbibed that water, drank that water, would get those curing medicines, which uh, reminds me of other uh, rock art or petroglyph and pictograph locales where people go and scrape off the stuff to make medicines and uh, to get powder from that and uh, also um, other properties. Now the vulva shapes, you find at a number of sites and basically how these diagrams were constructed is that the columns are arranged from simple to complex and uh, then in terms of presence and absence scores or percentage scores uh, ones that are next to each other are the most similar so you'll see that they, these things come out diagonal that's what they called uh, Pearson's presence action uh, uh, presence, absence, coefficient scores that uh, 
these uh, diagrams were created from. So you'll find that uh, there's quite straightforward forward evolver shapes on the left hand side, then getting more complicated towards the right, and then uh, track rock being having the most complicated things, and then some of the other sites having simpler stuff. And uh, evolver shapes, as I said, it's sort of a uh, I don't know what the right word is, maybe symbolic. It expresses the fertility that you can get at these rocks because women sometimes when they wanted babies, they will placate. They will also go up to these places or at least they'll have met some people going up there and uh, then want to acquire a fertility uh, like the fertility of the game. Uh, you can also get fertility of people and uh, these are most probably related to that. Uh, as I said, things are the roots reversed in the spirit world. So when the, me the, the medicine woman menstruate there, they create baby at the most, the least fertile, they become the most fertile. And uh, the tracks you find like this, uh, track rock got in a lot of tracks living up to its name. There's some other rocks too with a lot of uh, uh, human tracks. Sometimes they've got more than five toes. And, uh, you can see also the hand imprints there, the clawed hand on the right hand side, and then some animal tracks uh, in between. And the animal tracks are said to have come because Judicula's son, and sometimes Judicula himself, sometimes Kanati, sometimes the twin sons of Kanati, they uh, went up to rocks, lifted up the rocks, and out would come running the the deer and the birds and various other animals, rodents and stuff like that. They don't mention rodents, but you do get rodent imprints on the rocks. So the, it's interesting that you get some things in oral traditions uh, that you don't get on the rocks and vice versa. But in this time, in this case, you get these rodent tracks there in the middle column there, uh, places like Hickory Nut and a squirrel rock where um, stories of places like that um, at, for instance, a place in um, Western North Carolina, Gardner Rock, where you get a lot of uh, deer tracks. Uh, there is a story of, of, of Kanati, his sons. They followed him and uh, they saw him lift up a rock with animals coming out. And they didn't really know what they were doing, so they couldn't control it. They opened the rock and the animals just came out and escaped in big droves. And they left the imprints on the rock. And uh, there are probably more metaphorical reasons in these things. I mean, there are literal levels to these things and then more metaphoricals and more meta esoteric. And uh, I think for to, to really to get to the more esoteric, um, you know, perhaps one's got to speak to one of the medicine people. Maybe that uh, knowledge is not privy to anybody. But it again, it is a symptomatic of symbolic or an expression of uh, you know, the rock face being the veil between this world and the spirit world. And in the spirit world, which is dangerous uh, to negotiate, can bring big benefits if you get the right person to do uh, on your behalf to go to that world, uh, to go to the world where the spirit beings can always see you, but you can only see them if you can get somebody who's able to go there. Then the figures, some of them, as I said, are uh, representations of Judicula, an equivalent being like him, like Spearfinger and uh, uh, various other uh, deities uh, among the southeastern Indians. Um, some of the figures uh, are hollow bodies. They are later. They date to the Mississippian because of their position and their style uh, with the decapitated heads and the, the, um, the kind of staff that they bear. But then some of them are probably woodland. And uh, this memory of Judicula going way back into the wooden period and uh, just showing continuities and uh, how they remember. After all, in more recent times, Judicula did depart. And uh, then you get these concentric rings. Uh, they've got various uh, interpretations, identifications, uh, commonalities. They could signify whirlpools, which is kind of the entryways into uh, the, be uh, the the world of spirit beings, whirlpools, uh, could also be the entryway or way of, of, of submerged townhouses. They can represent townhouses, as I said earlier on. The arrangement of the um, 
post holes, if you look them from above, or once you've excavated them totally, and also in old drawings, uh, you see them uh, as in a concentric way, uh, with the central portion being the fire or the portal, either the, 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 the smoke hole at the top or the fireplace in the center at the bottom. And uh, then you get the simpler circles uh, dating to the late archaic, the early woodland, they're very faint or and or are superimposed by these later ones. Uh, then some of them has also been interpreted as curled up snakes. And these things are interrelated because sometimes townhouses are supposed to have a curled up snake inside. Uh, I've had Cherokees visiting me and they identified this, some of these things as snakes. And they could also be whirlpools because that's where snakes also live. So it's not necessarily mutually exclusive if you take into consideration that uh, multiple identifications could sometimes allude to the same idea. And then finally, you get these um, crossing ring, which could be, you know, the cardinal directions. It could be the sun. It could be the central fireplace. It could also be a volva. And in fact, you get some volva shape that were later on. You could see they came later and they transformed. They, they did this cross on top of the volva shape. And it's the same sort of thing as, as I said, the renewal ceremony during the end of the year. Uh, the origins of corn, the corn mother, Selu, gave origin to corn, gave birth to corn through a cross and circle. And uh, she kind of self-sacrificed. She was, she was killed by the two medicine people's sons, the medicine people that were the, uh, the shamans of the sons. She was killed by them. Again, sort of a metaphorical thing. And... Um, then they can be combined. They sometimes have couples in them. Uh, cardinal directions, uh, very important. Um, east, west, north, and south. Uh, but then they've also got up and down. And uh, they've also got where you are in those uh, cardinal directions. Because sometimes they talk about seven, the, the number seven. And uh, in, in addition to the four cardinal directions, I said you get up and down, which makes it uh, brings it up to five directions, six directions, and then the seven is where you are within that setup, that overall setup of uh, in relation to the sun and the spirit world and uh, procreation and so on. And then on top of those are the straight lines. Uh, not always sure what they are. Some of them functioned. Uh, at least in post-contact, more recent times, where, as I said, uh, where they pour um, water down and uh, then uh, added medicine to the water by virtue of going across the rock. So, it, again, it, 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 it sort of uh, links in with the wider significance of these rocks. And uh, so, basically, the point here is that these things were made to last. They did last, they were added to through the years. And uh, now we see a palimpsest of these different uh, things that were added through the years. But the fundamental reason behind it, I don't think has really radically changed. I mean, it's like Christianity changing, but you know, certain tenets staying the same. And with other religions too, like Judaism, so where we have uh, you know, written records that can show that changes did occur, but certain things do continue. And uh, certain central rituals also continue. In the case of the Southeastern Indians, they still do go into water and they still visit some of these rocks. Uh, some of the rocks are forgotten, but rocks like, uh, especially Judicula Rock, because it's not far from their reservation, uh, they still go there for various rituals. And um, so it's still important for these people after literally you know, a thousand years or more. Um, we, um, maybe not all the exactly the same things occur, but uh, that they are concerned about uh, the upkeep of these places and that people behave appropriately and that uh, information is uh, shared. Um, and um, that uh, we should care not only about the imagery, but also about what occurs close by. For instance, uh, when we worked at Judicula Rock, we found that 
there's a natural spring underneath it and uh, that is a great significance which shows as a portal to the spirit world in fact a lot of the drainages here in the southeast are underground it's like veins in your body arteries and uh, just depends where you prick them and then the blood will come out so it depends where you prick this points on the landscape and the, the blood will come out or the water will come out and sometimes the spirits will manifest and if you uh, ascribe or you know the tradition well enough and you follow the correct procedures and you do the uh, correct rituals and you have the right experiences the altered states the dreams the visions and so on you can then um, negotiate your way to the spirit world and return some people do not return but uh, these uh, rocks are on their way there and sometimes they rot there at the division the veil between the two worlds and uh, it's not as if every Native American would recognize it like that, but you know, after having spoken to a lot of people, uh, including central practitioners, some of them remarkably young still, but they really know this stuff. One can form kind of a general outline of these things. Uh, I would not say that 100% of the things that I said here are entirely correct i mean there's also a number of different interpretations but i think that one thing is certain is that one should look at these things not through your american eyes but through native american perceptions thank you very well put and we've been speaking this evening with yanni laubser uh, phd rpa the archaeologist and rock art specialist at stratum unlimited llc Again, we thank you. This is one of the most detailed descriptions that I've seen. Uh, it's really opened my eyes and mind to a lot of what's there. Again, I've had the opportunity to go to these sites and see them in person, and they are remarkable, but they certainly should be uh, revered and treated with the utmost respect. Uh, again, they are public, and you can go there and see them, but uh, it's something that is very special and something that is a part of the great story of North American history. So thank you again for joining us this evening, Dr. Laubster. If uh, anybody wants to contact you or follow along with the work that you're doing, uh, how would someone go about doing that? They can reach uh, the, me at the Stratum Unlimited website, stratumunlimited.com. Uh, uh, they'll see the summary of, of the work that I do there. And I try and update that so they can reach me there. Excellent. Well, again, that's Stratum Unlimited and our guest tonight, Dr. Yanni Laubser. It's been a pleasure speaking with you again. One of the most detailed and, uh, you know, just outstanding presentations. Uh, again, this is very important to all of us here in the Southeast and to everyone interested in North American archaeology. So until next time on the Seven Ages Audio Journal, we thank you all for joining us. And again, thank you for being here tonight, Dr. Laubser. Thanks for having me.